Um, last week we were talking about uh, Paul being in prison, right? And Paul being in chains for the sake of the gospel. And, um, and how his mission didn't change just because he was in chains from when he wasn't in chains. He still had the same, same mission. He still had the same purpose. His pur- purpose was to preach the gospel and to shine the light of Jesus. Now, before he was in chains, he did that by traveling all over the world and having a worldwide evangelistic ministry. But after he was in chains, he got to preach to, to people like the household guard. But he rejoiced in the fact that the gospel was being preached. So his mission was the same. Who he gets sent to on mission changes. But while he's in prison, he's writing this letter to the, the church in Philippi because when I read this, I, I get this feeling that, that Paul loves to be on mission and, and he knows where God sent him and he's okay with that. But also he loves this church and he wants to speak into this church's life and he wants to be a part of what's going on and connect uh, with his people. And I get this sense of an absent father a little bit when, it, when, when I'm reading this letter to the Philippians. Um, so we're going to begin this week in uh, Philippians 1.27. Uh, Paul's speaking as someone who cares for this church but can't be present, and so he's giving them instruction. So we'll start in Philippians 1.27. It says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one Spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, them meaning the people who oppose them, that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Amen? So he gives this instruction. He says, conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. And that's a good instruction for all of us, isn't it? Is, is that we be mindful that when we live our lives, we're not just living our lives for ourselves, but we're living our lives on mission with Christ, conducting ourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Jesus. Uh, and then he goes on to explain what that means. He says, if you conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, I will know that you are standing firm in the one Spirit. That you are striving together as one for the faith of the Gospel and that you're not frightened in any way by those who oppose you. So if you're living your life in a way that's worthy of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, I know that you're standing firm in the Spirit and that you're striving together as a group, as a community, and then you're unafraid. And he goes on to say that, that if you live in this way, and that it will be a sign to those who oppose you that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. So if they stand firm in the one Spirit, they strive together as one, uh, if they're not frightened by their opposition, it's going to be a sign to the people around them, to the people who aren't saved, that they're saved but destruction is coming to those who don't know Christ. That's an interesting thing to be a sign, isn't it? A sign is something that you hold up and gives instruction and gives, or another way to say it is you're going to be the evidence that this thing is true. But there's, there's more going on here than just uh, behavior. It's, it's more than just him going, hey, you guys come and be on your best behavior so that people know Jesus. There's more happening here than just people striving really hard. There's a manifestation of Jesus Christ in the lives of those who walk according to the Gospel. And that's the description of someone who does that. That His light is shining from their lives. There's a contrast that you see in the life of of a believer that, that, that contrasts with the world around it. In, in John 3.19, it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. 
So, so picture this. Jesus came as light of the world into the light, right? And it shined out into the darkness. And the darkness didn't like the light because it was revealing things in themselves that they didn't want revealed. They'd rather live in the darkness and continue to live selfishly for themselves in the way that they want to live. And so they snuffed out the light. They crucified Christ. But it didn't turn out very good for them, did it? They snuffed out the light. But what happened? He said, Jesus, it's better that I go so that I can send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and started to shine through all of the lives of those who were His. And so while they managed to kill Jesus, He rose from the dead, and He's shining through the lives of all of those who are His. It reminds me of, um, you guys watch Looney Tunes, right? You don't see Looney Tunes very much anymore. Um, but you guys always see the one where the dam starts breaking and then a crack appears and water starts shooting, a little stream of water starts shooting out of the dam. And then what do they do? They go up and they stick a finger in it, right? And then what happens? Like three or four more holes come and they, they try to stick more fingers than that and they got toes up there trying to keep this water from coming through the dam. That's a picture of Jesus because they tried to plug the hole. But as soon as they crucified Him, as soon as the Holy Spirit came, all these other little holes are popping up and now this light thing is kind of out of control. It's everywhere. So here Paul is communicating to the community in Philippi that if they stand firm in the Spirit, as they strive as one together, unafraid, that there'll be a sign. They'll shine the light. There'll be a hole in the dam, the, the flood that's coming of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus in their community. So how are they to do this? What does it look like for them to shine the light? And this is where this goes from being very intuitive to me to being something that I don't understand very well because God's ways are different than mine. Because God, <clears throat> Paul goes on to give two examples, and we're going to talk about the first one this week. And the first one is in, in Philippians 1.29. It says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So Paul's message here about a victorious church, right? He just says you're going to be a victorious church in that you're going to be sign and evidence that you're saved, but they're going to be destroyed. His picture of a victorious church is one that suffers well. And that's where he, he loses me a little bit. Thursday evening, we have prayer here. Um, and God always speaks to me when I come here. It's a really great time. I've learned during this Thursday night prayer, um, for me, prayer is more about listening than talking. Amen? And so just not feeling like I have to come Thursday night. We put worship music on that has words, and we can, you can worship if you want. You can sit in God's presence if you want. But not feeling like I, I have to come and say something. There's been times we come and the music ends, and then there's just, 20 or 30 minutes of silence in here. Like the, the, you can feel the thickness of the presence of God in the room and you're just sitting and being ministered to by His presence. And it's awesome. And so Thursday night, I had this amazing revelation that I want to share with you guys. And the revelation is this. God is smart. God's smart. And it, it's funny because <laughs> it's funny because when you hear God described, people use a lot of words, right? He's holy. He's awesome. He stands alone. There's all these descriptions of God, but you don't very often hear somebody say, He's smart. But, but God is smart. And, and that was what was highlighted for me on Thursday night. He's, I'm smart. The description, God's playing chess while everybody else is playing checkers. 
right? Like there's, he's got deeper movements and stuff going on. He's moving in ways that the people around him can't comprehend. I was reading a book. Uh, I don't remember which book it was, but he was describing God. And one of the things he was describing about how smart God is or how smart Jesus is. And he said, think about this. When you think about Jesus performing miracles in the Bible, it's almost like you think that he, if Jesus wants a miracle, the universe moves around him to, to make it happen. But what if instead we think about that a little bit differently? What if Jesus is, is healing somebody and he's actually going into that person with medical knowledge in the way that the body works and fitting things back together the way that they should be? Because why? Because he's smart and he knows how things work. God is so smart that he doesn't just understand physics, he made physics. So you could say he's the smartest scientist that ever lived. So God's smart. So you say, okay, Joe, we know God's smart, but here's the thing. We spend a lot of time in the church trying to understand Christianity. We spend a lot of time trying to understand doctrine and how it works and the way things work. But it's, it's, it's less important that we understand our religion than it is that we have a revelation of Jesus Christ in our life. That He's revealed in us. I, I had a, uh, someone who came to me one time who's like, Pastor Joe, I just don't understand the Trinity. Can you explain it to me? I said, probably not. But I said, I look at it this way, and I went through some of the analogies that I used to help me to understand it a little bit better. We talked for about a half an hour, and she goes, I just don't, I still don't get it. And I go, you know what? It's not important for you to understand it. It's just important for you to believe. If I had to understand everything that I believed, I'd be in trouble. Matter of fact, I don't want a Christianity that I can comprehend. If the answer and the agenda and the plan that God has for my life is something that, that I can understand, it's probably not good enough for me because I know me. He's got to do some deep level movement in my life that I probably can't understand. So I, I don't even want in my life a plan or a purpose that makes sense to me. Because as soon as it makes sense to me, there's something wrong with it, right? Like there must be, there's got to be a deeper thing going on here. So, so I'd say that to say that, that this world that we live in is a world of suffering. Everybody, everybody suffers. There's, there's great moments in this life. But for all of those, the, those moments are punctuated by moments of suffering. I want to tell you a story. <laughs> I felt bad after I told the story of the first service, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it again anyways. Uh, we, got a, we, had gotten, we got a kitten um, several months ago. And she was a beautiful white kitten, Burmese cat. And uh, she had a nerve disorder from her mom because her mom was sick while she was pregnant. And it, it didn't hurt the cat. It just made her really awkward and, and not very coordinated. And so she'd stumble around and bumbly, you know, and it just captured my heart. This cat captured my heart. And this cat brought joy to our house. Um, she was awesome. But we, we took her in to get her fixed last week, and then she got sick and died. I, I wrestle with that. That's hard for me. And I'm not really, I'm not someone who normally has a hard time with that very much. But that was difficult for me. But that's a great picture. I tell that story because it's a great picture of our world. There are things in this world that bring us joy. But sometimes it's even those very things that later cause us pain. I've heard people say, you know, when their when their pets die. My dad lost a lab 
recently. And he goes, I don't want another dog because I don't want to go through that again. I've heard people say that, right? How much worse with people? People that you love and, and you come to know and, or a son or a daughter or a father or an uncle that you love and, and then they die because that's what everybody does. That's hard. So this, 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 is, this world is a world of suffering. So here's what my intelligence says. What would be really great in my Christianity is that if the gospel worked in such a way that when you got saved, you didn't have to suffer anymore. That makes sense to me because, man, it would be a really popular belief if, if you're like, man, I noticed those people get saved. They don't have hard times anymore. They don't get sick anymore. Nobody around them is dying. They're living forever. That makes sense to me. That, now, we got, now we're talking. But, but God doesn't do things the way that, that makes sense to me. Because He loves us too much to do that. God's plan is that while we are living in this world suffering, while we're living in this world of suffering, that we're also going to suffer. We're also going to go through things that, that make us suffer. But sometimes, uh, we get to suffer even more. Because we're shining the light of Jesus, and the world still loves the darkness. This, the world still loves the darkness. Have you guys heard the ex expression, if you haven't bumped shoulders with the devil today, maybe you're going in the same direction? Have you heard that? Like, if you're pursuing Jesus, that's going to make your life harder in some ways. And, and a lot of times it's because he's asking us to deny ourselves. And that's hard. But God's plan while we're in this world of suffering, while sometimes we also have to suffer, is that for those who are His, when they suffer, they get to suffer standing firm in the one Spirit. They get to suffer striving as one with their brothers and sisters in Christ for the Gospel of the faith. And they get to suffer unafraid. So yes, we're living in a world of suffering, but we go to do so with the Spirit of God empowering us and present with us. And, and He just happens to be the answer for every problem that we'll ever have. And again, I don't necessarily need to understand what that answer is, but I get to trust Him in the midst of the things that I'm going through. We get to, when we do have to suffer, we get to suffer with our brothers and sisters in Christ coming alongside of us. And I have to say that I don't, I can't even comprehend how much I would not want to go through this life without brothers and sisters in Christ alongside me to encourage me and to lift me up and to love on me. It, it's, it's, it never fails like I go to church if I'm having a bad time, if I'm going through something. Somebody will come alongside of me and say, hey, are you okay? Can I pray for you? I think for me, that's usually because normally I'm really loud. And if, if I'm going through something, I get quiet. And if I'm quiet, people go, there's something going on with you. <laughs> but, but to have brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Lord gave me a prophetic picture of, of relationship in the church. You guys know how sometimes when you go to a new church, it's, it, it's, it starts off being really awkward, doesn't it? Because you go in, you're sitting with all these people that are family, but you, you, you don't know anybody yet. And he gave me this picture of this, this field of sand. And under the sand were these pockets of gold, gold coins. But they were all covered up with about an inch of sand. And so there's, a, there's this initial work that you have to go out there and brush the sand aside, and, and, but you find these pockets of gold. And that's relationship in the church. It takes a little bit of effort to go out there and establish connection with people. But when you start establishing that connection, they become gold in your life. They become a treasure to you. 
They become a resource to you. And the more connections you have with people in the body and the more those relationships get built up, the more that you have people who are surrounding you that can lift you up. And when we, when we have to suffer, we can suffer unafraid because we know that this isn't our home. Like everything that happens here is temporary. Everything that happens here is just for a little while. And then when we go home, that's for eternity. There's this uh, Scripture in Joshua 5, verse 13. It says, Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or are you for our enemies? And the man said, Neither. He replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? You know, there's this, there's this I love this because it, 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 it describes something that I think is very important for us. I think we, a lot of times we want God to be on our team. But... If you think about that, that's not really what you want to happen. What you want to happen is you want to be on God's team. Because God's smarter than we are. His team is going to win. When the angel of the Lord stood before Joshua, and Joshua said, are you for us or for our enemies? He goes, no. I am the angel of the Lord. So he's saying, you have a choice to be for me. You have a choice to be on my team. And there's this mindset and this mentality that we need to stop asking God to be on our team with what we have going on and start saying, Lord, what are you doing and how can I be a part of that? What are you doing and how can I join your team? Because his team always wins. But... Here's the, here's the thing. Is God is smart. And His team doesn't always look like it's winning to me. Jesus achieved victory by dying. I don't get it. If I was on His team, and we're going out there, and He goes, okay, the first thing we're going to do on this game is we're going to lose. I'm going to die. I'm like, Lord... That doesn't make sense to me at all. I thought you were going to be king. I thought you were the son of man. That you were going to be high and exalted and lifted up. But you're going to die on a cross? It's the same thing in our lives. When we choose to partner ourselves with the Lord, when we're walking in step with Him, and we go through stuff, and we say, Lord, like, why am I going through this? If, if your team was really winning, why have I not been delivered from these problems? But we have to let the Lord win His way because He's got a bigger picture in mind. He's got, he sees the whole thing, doesn't He? And He knows the greater objectives. Some may be asking right now, um, this is the Christmas service. Where's the baby Jesus? <laughs> um, originally, I was going to go into um, Philippians chapter 2 today as well, but there's just too much here to talk about. And in Philippians chapter 2, it does talk about Jesus coming and, and making Himself a servant. And that's the Christmas story, isn't it? You know, we celebrate Jesus being born and we have our cute nativity scenes and it's all very special. But I always wonder, what was Jesus coming like to him? Where you leave this place that's perfectly fine and awesome and you go to a place that's full of sin, full of drama, 
full of mixed up minds and chaos. I, um, I was on a youth trip with the church one time. And we went to a Red Robin in this town that was really close to a mill. And it stank really bad. Like it was so stinky. And I got off the bus and this wall of smell just hit me. And so I walk into the Red Robin and the whole restaurant stinks. And I asked the waitress, I go, how can you stand that smell? I was not a very kind child. How can you stand that smell? And she goes, what smell? And that's us. Because we live in this world. And we're used to the stink. We're, we're acclimated to the, to the disgusting sin and mindset and drama and violence and murder and lying and cheating and corruption. Like we're acclimated to that stuff. But Jesus left a perfectly good heaven that didn't smell at all. And He came because He loved us so much that He was willing to be around that kind of dysfunction in order to save us. That's the Christmas story, isn't it? And we're going to talk more about, about chapter 2 next week. But today I want to encourage you that it's not always your shining moments of victory that preach the Gospel the loudest. It's not always when you're doing really well and you're dancing through a field of daisies all the time because that's not real. But sometimes what preaches the Gospel the loudest is that when we go through hard times, when we suffer, that we suffer well. That we, we, we suffer in unity with the Holy Spirit. We suffer walking in step with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that we go through these things unafraid. Because we know that He's got us. So, today I want to encourage you to conduct yourselves then in a manner that's worthy of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That when life throws stuff at you that isn't fun, that's, that's suffering, that's difficult, that we spend less time complaining to God about our circumstances and more time just living well in His presence during the suffering. Amen? It's okay to pray and ask God to deliver you from suffering, but He doesn't always do that. And He's smarter than we are. And He's got a better plan for us. Amen?